So the things we're going to discuss tonight are what are some eating habits that can support a healthy immune system? Eating habits that can increase our risk of some of the comorbidities that have been associated with poor outcomes from COVID-19, as well as evidence for herbal remedies as it relates to COVID-19. But before we get into it, I just want to break the ice a little bit with you all who are on the phone with a couple of questions. The first one is, growing up, what did you learn about food in your household? And how did what you saw as a child affect your food choices as an adult? I'm going to go first, and then anyone else that wants to contribute, you can do so. I remember we always kept a picture of Kool-Aid in our refrigerator at all times, and the Kool-Aid my mother thought that she was being healthier because she would always mix it with orange juice. And if anyone knows about the Kool-Aid, you know, we put about a whole bag of sugar over into that, that drink. And that's what we had on a regular basis. And my mother was also the cook for the entire neighborhood, our church, whenever you needed some cake or a pie or something she was the one that made it so we always grew up with a lot of sweets and it wasn't until I was early on in my nursing school um, actually one of my study buddies because I used to have sweets for like breakfast lunch dinner me and my study buddy we would literally I would have like a milkshake for lunch and not have any real food and then one day she goes to me you know what there people are saying that fat is bad but sugar, you know, it's not good for us too. And so I was like, in that moment when she said that to me, then I started, you know, reading and seeing for myself, oh yes, I'm really consuming a lot of sugar. And from there, it was like a moment that, you know, I realized that I had to make changes for my own health in regards to that. And we are going to talk about um, sugar a little bit more in depth once we get into the presentation, but that's just something from my childhood, um, you know, how I grew up and, and how it affected me as an adult. And then eventually the change I made once I learned about it. Um, I just want to make a general disclaimer that there is not any specific or supplement that is proven to prevent infection against COVID-19. However, when we eat a balanced diet and we have adequate nutrition, our immune system can be healthy and strong to fight off to help us fight infection should it occur. So these are some of the some of the nutrients that help to support a healthy immune system. We have vitamin A, vitamin B12, B6, vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E, zinc, and iron. So let's talk about some of the foods where we can find these nutrients. So your foods that are rich in vitamin A um, and beta carotene, beta carotene, you're going to find a lot in your um, vegetables that are orange and red, and your body can make vitamin A out of that beta carotene. Um, other foods that have vitamin A is going to be rich, your liver, your dairy products, um, broccoli, and many of you have that piece. Foods rich in our vitamin B12, you're going to find that in your animal products, uh, predominantly like meat, da uh, dairy, eggs, and it can also be found in cereals that are fortified and some of your non-dairy milks that have been fortified with that. Your B6 you're going to get from fish, liver, um, your starchy vegetables, um, you know, the potato, cassava, um, yams, and also your non-citrus fruits. Those have a lot of the B6 in it. And your B vitamins, those help to support immunity. Your B12, it's necessary for a proper formation of your red blood cells, which are important in our, to our immune system, as well as the B6 um, supports our immune function, as well as the hemoglobin formation. Now, vitamin C. When you think about vitamin C, we, I think many of us think of first as our citrus fruits, you know, our oranges, our lemons, our limes. 
then believe it or not, our bell peppers are an excellent source of vitamin C, the red and the green bell peppers. Uh, you can also get it from kiwi, broccoli, cabbage, for those cabbage lovers in the group, um, cantaloupe, and uh, cassava is another example. Now, vitamin C is an important antioxidant. So what is an antioxidant? That is a substance that helps to protect our cells from damage caused by free radicals. Now, free radicals, that's something that our body makes naturally just going about our daily life living. It's part of our aging process, but we can also um, pr produce more free radicals when we're exposed to things like pollution. Anybody that smokes is going to have more of those um, radiation exposure, some kind of chemical exposures, uh, industrial chemical exposures. So vitamin C can help to ward off the effects of those um, excess free radicals. And it overall, it's good for building an efficient immune response in general. Now, in a, as a, in a supplement form, whether or not it specifically protects you from COVID-19, we don't have the evidence to support that at this time. Um, but most individuals, if you're eating a lot of these foods that you see here, um, can easily get the sufficient amount of vitamin C in the diet. Next is vitamin D, and I know you've been hearing a lot about this from our previous presenters because we do have literature now that's showing that individuals with lower vitamin D levels are at risk for having poorer outcomes should they have COVID-19. Now we can get vitamin D through three different ways. We can get it through sun exposure. Um, however, it's a little more difficult for black people to get it because our melanin that as actually serves to protect us from the sun um, blocks us from making it as efficiently as a white person or somebody that with very fair skin. So we can get in the sun for about 15 minutes a day uh, to produce it naturally, but we can also get it in our diet. And the foods in, in our diet that um, are rich in vitamin D include your fatty fish, um, you know, it's like salmon, egg yolks, cheese, mushrooms, and it can also be found in fortified products. Again, you see a lot of milk fortified with vitamin D or different cereals fortified with vitamin D. And like you said, not only uh, are we at risk for having low vitamin D levels because of our melanin, but also uh, we know that there is higher rates of obesity among uh, black people. And that's an additional risk factor for having low vitamin D levels because vitamin D gets stored in fat cells. And so the more fat on the body, then there's that more of that vitamin D is stored in that fat instead of circulating around in the body, doing what it needs to be doing to help our immune system. So with that being said, you know, if you think that you might be at risk for low vitamin D or if you don't know what your level is, you can speak to your healthcare provider to see if you should get your level checked or to see if you should be taking any supplements. Next is vitamin E. This is another vitamin that also has antioxidant properties. And remember we said that our antioxidants can help us to uh, protect us against those extra free radicals, which are products of metabolism, as well as our exposure to the uh, pollution, or extra smoke and some, some things in our environment that can also contribute to that. And it's also involved in our natural immune response. And vitamin E also helps us in the formation of our red blood cells, which carry the oxygen through our bodies. 
you can get vitamin E in foods such as wheat germ, um, nuts and seeds, like your peanut butter, peanuts, sunflower seeds, also green leafy vegetables like our spinach, our collard greens, kale, mustard greens, kalaloo. And most individuals, you know, can meet their sufficient dietary requirements through the food with this vitamin E as well. Zinc, that's another one that's been going around a lot in the news. Uh, zinc is a mineral. Um, it's called an essential trace element and we just need very little bits of it for our health. And we don't store the zinc in our bodies and so that's why we need to have it uh, incorporated into our diet on a regular basis to make sure that we do get the small amounts that we do need for our health. Foods where you can find zinc, oysters is one of the highest sources. Um, it's in seafood, such as crab, poultry, so your chickens, your turkeys, can be found in red meat. Again, seeds such as pumpkin seeds and also a variety of beans also contain zinc. As far as zinc as a supplement, at this time, there is not sufficient evidence to support it as a supplement for preventing COVID-19 for the general population. Um, however, if you have, if and this goes for any of the nutrients we're discussing today, for those individuals that have any kind of disorder that prevents you from absorbing your nutrients properly, uh, you know, or malnourished where they're just not having access to a variety of foods in the diet, then you can speak to your healthcare provider if you should supplement it in your specific case. But for the general population, there's not evidence to support um, recommending zinc supplements against COVID-19. Next is our foods that are rich in iron. Um, and our iron, you know, again, that is important for the health of our red blood cells and carrying the oxygen through our body. And when we don't have enough iron and we have uh, what is called iron deficiency anemia, that is associated with having a decreased immune response. So foods that are in iron, again, is uh, meat, seafood, you can get it from beans, nuts, dried fruits, um, you know, uh, dried apricots, uh, raisins, and things like that. Again, our green leafy vegetables, so we're back to the collard greens, uh, mustard greens, the kale, the kalaloo, and a variety of whole grain products also have iron in it. So this is this healthy eating plate, this is just a guideline for what you can have in mind when you're designing your plates. You will see here that the largest section is vegetables. So good thing tonight that we have some vegetable lovers in the crowd um, because the more veggies and a greater variety, like you said, if you were seeing as we were going through those different nutrients that support the immune system. You saw vegetables come up on a lot of those slides. So they can provide you a lot of vitamins, minerals, uh, antioxidants that do support the immune system. And in this section where it's the green vegetables, we're focusing on our non-starchy vegetables. So we're not including the potatoes and uh, the French fries in that section and the, uh, you know, sweet potatoes and uh, squashes. Those are our starchy vegetables. But this one is focusing more on those leafy greens and the broccoli, uh, you know, bell pepper, non-starchy non vegetables. Then we see here, we have a section for fruit. We wanna make sure that we're getting a variety of fruit in our diet. I say, eat the rainbow. We have a section for healthy protein. 
Uh, we want to focus on lean meats, uh, fish, poultry, beans and nuts can go in this section. And we want to avoid bacon, cold cuts and other processed meats. And why do I say that? Um, now we have evidence, uh, the World Health Organization has classified red meats now is called a, a class 2A carcinogen. And what does that mean? Carcinogen is meaning that it could cause cancer. Now the classification that this in is not saying that it definitely does, but it's saying that we have enough evidence to show that there seems to be an association between those that are consuming red meat on a regular basis and cancers, particularly colorectal cancer, and a little bit of evidence that it could increase risk for pancreas and the prostate cancer. So that's why we wanna limit, not that you can't have it, but we wanna limit the amount of times per week that we have the red meat to about two to three times a week. Um, the process, the, uh, the bacon, cold cuts and other processed meat. So processed meat, that's any meat that has been salted and fermented or undergone some kind of processing time to extend the shelf life of it so that it can last for longer. So that's gonna include your hot dogs and uh, the ha cured hams, uh, sausages, bologna, beef jerky, canned meat. And I certainly have my share of, of bologna sandwiches in my day, but at now the World Health Organization for those processed meat, those in that category is classified as a group one carcinogen, which means they do have enough evidence to show that when these items are consumed on a regular basis, that it does contribute to the development of colon cancer. So that's why we wanted to limit those as much as possible. Now we have our section here for the whole grains and we wanna eat a variety of whole grains, uh, you know, brown rice or oatmeal. Um, if you're gonna do bread, you can get the whole grain bread. And we have Healthy oils, we want to choose oils that um, have un, or that don't have the saturated fat in them. That means that if it's at room temperature, it should be liquid. So these are oils like olive oil, canola oil, avocado oil. Um, and we can use these on our salad. And just because they're considered the healthy oils, that's not free range, you know, to, to use them in excess. We still want to use, um, we're going to talk about portion size in just a little bit. We still want to use them sparingly because um, it, it, an oil is still a processed food and you can easily rack up your amount of fat that you're consuming and your calories, but in moderation. Um, these healthy oils can help, especially if you combine it like over your salad because it can help you to better absorb some of the uh, nutrients from the vegetables when you combine it with a little bit of, of healthy fat. Next we see up here is water. Thank you. So that is exactly the next thing that I was, what I was gonna lead into. We want to limit, we wanna drink mostly water or you can drink tea or coffee with little or no sugar because you can really rack up um, not only your calories, but your sugar intake, um, which we're gonna talk about. Like I said, we're gonna talk a little bit more in depth about that in just a little bit. This visual that you see here is a guide to what portion sizes should look like when you're having your meals. When we're thinking about our protein section on that plate, a serving, so let's say you're gonna have chicken as your protein for that day, is about the size of the palm of your hand. 
that's one serving. And I know that we, uh, you know, sometimes we make that portion, the main course, we might have two or three big pieces of chicken on there and a little bit of vegetables, but I would encourage you to turn that around and make half your plate of vegetables and use meat more as like your condiment on the side. And then when it's done like that, then it'll be easier for you to stay within those three the size of the palm of your hand serving size, which is about three ounces. When we're talking about our whole grains, um, our rice, our pastas, um, we conclude our, our starchy vegetables in here. Fruit, a serving size is about the size of your fist, which is gonna give you about a cup. Uh, beans and potatoes, you're gonna take your cupped hand, it's gonna be about a half a cup. Is your two cupped hands, if you're gonna have a snack on uh, popcorn, pretzels, or chips, two cups for your hands is about one ounce, that's the serving size. Now we use our thumb to measure serving sizes for like our cheeses, hard, hard cheeses, peanut butter, um, your cooking oil, because remember when I said we have the healthy oils that are on there, our oils with our unsaturated fat that are liquid at room temperature, but we still want to use those within the correct portion size. So that's your thumb tip. So keep that in mind. And that goes also for your mayonnaise, for your butter. Um, some other things that I, before I move on to the, the sugar portion, I did want to also mention when we're talking about, uh, we're talking about the meats and the different foods to be in mind, mindful of the preparation, because now that you see that a serving of cooking oil is this size, what does that mean if you're thinking about frying chicken? You, you, you can't fry chicken in a serving size of this much oil, right? So we wanna think about um, the preparation of our food because in order to stay within the serving size for that, you can do things, you can bake your meat. Um, if you really like the texture that you get or the crunch from the fry, you can even make a coating uh, you can take like a crackers or cereal and crunch it up and mix your seasonings in there and coat it. And then you can bake it in the oven and that will still give you a little crunch. And if you can, if you have access to those, um, they have silicone baking mats that you can put on the bottom of your pans and that will help it when it's baking in the oven, it will get a little bit crispy on the outside or either a, a wire rack. And now they have even the, the air fryers. I haven't tried that myself, but I, I have seen them now where you can use very little oil um, and you put it in that air fryer and it will still get the food crispy on the outside if you uh, are partial to that texture of the fry. But that's a way to do it without having so much excess oil involved that we know um, because fried food is is another thing that's actually individuals that eat fried foods on a regular basis have an increased risk of early death. And we know that fried foods, when you're frying foods, a lot of times, not only does it have all that extra oil, which is contributed to a lot more fat intake than what we should be having, but it also has a lot more salt, um, which we're gonna get into that in a bit. And I'm saying fried chicken is an example, but it, it's not only the meats that you have to look out for that are fried. You know that a lot of pastries are fried, donuts are fried. Um, our potato chips, sometimes we don't think about it, but most of those are fried. Um, and even for those that are salad lovers, you have to look out because a lot of the toppings that they sell, like these tortilla uh, strips and the crispy onions and all of those things, have been fried. So you had to be careful uh, with that as well. 
Now, one thing that Miss Vicky has already shared with us that she is improving upon by drinking more water instead of the sugary beverages is avoiding the excess sugars. Now, the American Heart Association actually recommends that women consume no more than six teaspoons a day of added sugar and men no more than nine teaspoons a day. So when I'm saying added sugar, I mean any sugar that occurs on its own that you add to food. Like I'm not talking about fruits that have their natural sugar and you're eating the whole fruit, but I'm talking about you're making a pitcher of Kool-Aid and you're adding a bag of sugar to that to make it sweet or you're baking a cake and you're adding the sugar to that. Um, as well as a lot of the things we uh, eat that aren't even sweet that we don't think about a lot of salad dressings um, ketchup, barbecue sauce and things actually have sugar added to that and that's contributing to um, our intake of added sugars. And when you, anybody that drinks soda, I want you to take a look at the back of your, your soda bottle or your can and see how many grams of sugar that it says it has in that one serving. And then I also want you to look at how many servings it says that are in a bottle. Because four grams of sugar is equivalent to one teaspoon of sugar. And when you look at that label, I'm sure you're going to find that just drinking that soda, you've already are over the recommended sugar intake for the day that AHA recommends. But I just have a short video here that I want to share that goes a little more in depth about the sugar. The average American consumes nearly 70 pounds of added sugars each year without even knowing it. Can you imagine? In adults, this has been linked to obesity, diabetes, cancer, high blood pressure, metabolic syndrome, and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. It may even play a role in food allergies autoimmune diseases, irritable bowel syndrome, and behavioral issues. In children, moderate evidence indicates a relationship between all these sugars and an increased risk of cavities. Some studies also show they increase the risk of childhood obesity by 55%. Because all of this, medical and public health fields are really cracking down on added sugars in our diet. The USDA has found that Americans age one and older are eating too much sugar, fat, and sodium, and not enough dairy, fruits, vegetables, or oils in their diet. One of the areas we struggle most with is added sugars. The 2015 to 2020 USDA guidelines recommends healthy eating patterns with added sugars accounting for less than 10% of our daily calories. The American Heart Association recommends that adults try to limit them to about 25 grams for women, 36 grams for men. For kids, they recommend setting that limit at 12 to 25 grams per day, depending on the child's size. That's three to six teaspoons. But when we say added sugars, what exactly do we mean? Added sugar is the extra sugar that isn't naturally in our food. Fruits, vegetables, and dairy products, for example, all naturally have some sugar, and those sugars are okay. What we are talking about is the sugar added during processing or baking to make things sweet. Drinks, yogurts, ice cream, cake, you get the idea. Up to three quarters of our packaged foods have added sugars. These include table sugar, syrups, and other caloric sweeteners and are noted on labels by all sorts of different names. Be careful about honey and maple syrup. While they are natural, they still count as added sugars. The main reason added sugars are a problem is that they load our food with far more calories than it would have naturally, with no real benefit. In fact, excess sugar is turned into fat. But how do we translate this for practical eating and address childhood and adolescent nutrition needs? Discuss with your provider and dietitian how you can meet these goals. When juices are consumed, the AAP recommends they should be limited to four to six ounces of 100% juice without added sugars. In the kitchen, the American Heart Association suggests baking with 30 to 50% less sugar in recipes might not affect taste too much. Substitute unsweetened applesauce for sugar in recipes. Use extracts, almond, vanilla, orange, and lemon in recipes for enhanced taste. Add fresh or dried fruits to cereal, porridge, or oatmeal.
Know that children between 4 to 13 years of age are most at risk for rapid rise in added sugar intake. Some sugars are hiding in plain sight. Flavored yogurts can add up to 30 grams of sugar or more. One tablespoon of ketchup or barbecue sauce may contain a teaspoon of sugar. We should also identify the major sources of added sugar in a typical diet and target those. Sweetened beverages account for half the intake. Snacks and sweets account for around one third of the intake. So these two alone account for 80%. Reduce these and you are near to achieving your goal. So that's it. Added sugars can adversely affect our health. Children over the age of four are most at risk for rapid rise in added sugar intake. There are many practical strategies to decrease intake of added sugars while still enjoying our food. Thanks for watching. Okay, so that gave you a little more detail about uh, the sugar and what are the reasons that we want to avoid it because even our blood pressure is shown now that it can affect our blood pressure. We think about salt a lot of times when we think about our blood pressure, but also the sugar can affect it. The other thing that we want to conscious of in our, our diets when we're thinking about um, managing or preventing if we don't already have it, these comorbidities such as high blood pressure and um, heart disease is our sodium intake. Now for sodium, the American Heart Association recommends the 2300 milligram of sodium a day maximum. Ideally, it would be 1,500 milligrams a day. And that's what we really want to aim for because it seems is in regards to our blood pressure as black people that we're a bit more salt sensitive than um, our Caucasian counterpoints. And this just gives you an idea here about how much, how many milligrams of salt. One teaspoon of salt is 2,300 milligrams. So for those of us that like to sit down at the table and start shaking the salt on before we stop, before we even taste the food, that's something to think about because it's only one teaspoon and you've already met your, your daily sodium intake. Now, believe it or not, the majority of the sodium in the diet comes from processed foods and from restaurant foods. It's only about 10% that is coming from the food that we add ourselves while we're cooking. So if you can, if it's possible for you to cook at home, that's one way and to cook your own food, um, then that's one way that you can cut down on a lot of that as well, because that's what the American Heart Association estimate that we just get 10% of our overall sodium intake from cooking our food. Um, there is some naturally occurring sodium content in food. Uh, that's about 15%. But like I said, it's 70% is coming from our processed foods and our restaurant foods, our canned foods. So what are the risks associated with this increased sodium intake? Um, like we said, we know that it can affect our blood pressure it, it causes the body to hold on to excess fluid. And so then we have some consequences that can come from that when it, we've held on to the excess fluid for, for too long, which could be heart failure, um, having our heart muscle get enlarged because it has to work too hard to pump the excess fluid that we're retaining in our bodies because of the sodium, um, could lead to kidney disease, stroke, uh, kidney stones. Okay, that's just some of them. So what can we do about this? Um, if you have only access to the canned foods, what you can do, um, like your canned vegetables, you can rinse them off. So that will help take off some of the excess sodium that's already in there. And like I said, as much as you can, 
just try to make your own foods instead of using the prepackaged meals like the TV dinners and things like that, very high in sodium. If you're going to go to a restaurant, some of the highest, well, right now we shouldn't be <laughs> in the restaurant because of the pandemic, because we know that eating at restaurant increases our risk. But if you're getting carry out, um, some of the highest sodium foods at a lot of restaurants is going to be the soups. We think, oh, the soup might be a good choice. Maybe it has some nutrition in it, but most restaurant soups are very high in sodium. What we can also do even when we're cooking is instead of um, adding extra salt, we can make sure that we're using a lot of herbs and spices in our cooking to add extra flavor to the foods without having to add excess salt. And before I go to the herbal remedies, I wanted to mention the same thing that I said for, you can rinse off your canned vegetables, rinse that water off in there to get rid of some of the salt from the canning process. The same thing goes for sugar and canned fruits. If you can't get access to fresh fruit or frozen fruit and all you have is the canned, um, you know, a lot of the canned fruits, you'll see that it says that it's in heavy syrup, which has, um, the added sugars that we're talking about, but you can do the same thing. You can pour that heavy syrup off and you can rinse it and that will take away some of that excess sugar that they have there. Now, in regards to the herbal remedies, overall, this is a message to make sure that you can consult your healthcare provider before you start any new herbal or supplement regimen. Now we know we have a lot of uh, remedies. We have remedies, whatever our grandmother used to give us when we were sick all the time and things that have been passed down through our different cultures and ages. Um, really at this time, we don't have the evidence to say that any particular remedy can prevent us from getting COVID-19 or any particular remedy can treat COVID-19. There are some, however, that we know that we need to take precautions for because it could be harmful to us because just because something is natural does not mean that it is safe, particularly if you may be taking other medications. So especially if you're on certain medications if you're interested in trying a remedy or taking a certain herb, you need to make sure to speak with your healthcare provider to make sure it's not going to have any um, negative interaction with the medication that you're taking. Uh, one of the things that seem to be coming up lately is the elderberry as a remedy. And the elderberry actually has uh, evidence that it can promote what is called a cytokine storm. And that is one of the reactions that COVID-19, that has been seen in COVID-19 patients already. So we want to avoid that particular supplement because we don't want, to, that's basically in when your immune system overreacts, when you call the cytokine storm, because it's releasing, um, the immune cells are releasing specific substances, but it's, it's too many of it. Um, another one, uh, the colloidal silver. There is no evidence to support it uh, as for treating infections. It can actually cause, uh, depending on your skin tone, it can leave a blue tinge to the skin that can be permanent if it's used over time. Now, a lot of these other things that we like to take, uh, garlic, green tea, our ginger, a Cerise. There's a lot of, uh, you know, your herbal teas, they do have antioxidants in them. Um, as we talked about earlier, antioxidants can be good for our overall health. Um, however, there's not any evidence that it in particular can prevent or treat the COVID-19. So, you know, our herb herbal teas and the, the garlic and all of that it's generally safe as, as part of a normal diet. And it can even help, you know, help us with some of the 
stress from the aspect of um, herbal teas is if you use that sometimes before you go to bed, you have a cup of tea to help you relax, you know, in that aspect, it can be helpful. But from the perspective of preventing or treating COVID-19, we just at this time don't have the evidence because the virus is still new and we're still learning, learning things about it. So what I want everyone to take away from this presentation tonight is to know that small changes over time in your dietary habits can lead to big health results. And so what I mean by this is from all the information that we covered tonight, if you see that, oh, we've covered, um, we know that the fruits and vegetables are good and that we wanna avoid the excess sugars and the soda, and maybe you're someone that likes to sit down and drink your soda and eat your potato chips while you watch Netflix at night, I don't know. But what I'm saying with this is that you don't have to change your whole diet all at once because that could be setting yourself up for failure. But if you have a set a goal, a small goal, for example, um, I always think about one of the, the nurses that actually trained me when I first came out of nursing school, she drank Mountain Dew the way that we should be drinking water, like eight to 10 uh, glasses a day. And uh, so if you drink soda like that, you know, you might start by saying, okay, instead of having the soda four times a day, I'm gonna cut it in half for a month. And then after that month, you say, okay, now I'm gonna cut it down to one and to two, you know, don't try to change everything all at once. Make a goal that is realistic for you to achieve. And then also know why, why do you wanna make healthier, uh, choices in your diet, you know? Is it for your health? Is it to be there because you have a loved one to take care of because you have a child that you wanna see grow up, you know? Think about why you wanna do it because when you have that in mind, it can help you to stay motivated towards your goal and then just make small goals that you can work towards time by time. But over time, that will pay off. So in summary of what we talked about, um, our vitamins and minerals that help support our immune system, again, our vitamin A, B12, B6, vitamin C, vitamin D, our vitamin E, our zinc and our iron, which we can get through eating, eating the rainbow, as I say, eating a well-balanced diet with plenty of fruits and vegetables we want to aim for. half of your plate to be vegetables at your meals. About four servings of fruits of different varieties, about five servings of vegetables a day. Eating our whole grains that has our fiber in it and that also has uh, our vitamin E in there. Having our uh, nuts, eating red meat once or twice a week poultry two to three times a week. Snacking, uh, we know that during the pandemic, we're stressed. Um, some of us deal with the stress by wanting to snack more on things. If you're able to, instead of the potato chips, if you like crunchy things, if you're able to get fresh vegetables, like a cucumber or uh, celery, carrot sticks that you can cut up and have already ready in your fridge that you can just snack on those and you can still get a crunch and you can still have that snack that you want, but you're still at the same time you're getting vitamins and minerals um, and less calories than snacking on the chips or donuts or cookies or something like that. Again, we talked about our, our healthy fats, our oils that are liquid at room temperature, that don't have the saturated fat in it, but also being mindful of the serving size. Remember the thumb size. 
making sure that we're drinking eight to 10 glasses of water every day to help the nutrients to get through our system. If you are somebody that does not like water, some of the things you can try is to add different fruits in your water and let it sit and infuse the flavor that will add some flavor to it without adding the sugar. And also we didn't, um, it was on the, so the slide with the plate. This is not nutrition, but maintain active as much as possible as well, that inadequate sleep in conjunction with the nutrition point part helps to support a healthy immune system during this COVID-19. I also wanted to share with you um, some of the upcoming food drive distributions where they're giving away fresh fruits and vegetables. This is through Feeding South Florida, uh, Miami-Dade County. You can see the different locations up here. And these are upcoming, gonna be on the third, fourth and fifth. There's also distributions through the Farm Share Program coming up at different locations, as well as um, Urban Oasis. It's not a giveaway, but they do accept the SNAP benefits and they're actually doubling the benefits um, currently for fruits and vegetables. So that's another um, option you know, that can be shared with anybody of whom it may be of benefit. And that concludes my presentation. Any questions, discussion?